What was gaming like in the 2000s? On December 31st, 1999, at 11.59 p.m., I sat trembling in my room, the aliens? awaiting the annihilation of the world. My God. I closed my eyes, aliens? ready for the alien mothership to appear in the night sky, for computers to come alive and implode the very fabric of society. Y2K was going to kill us all. Mr. Jones down the street built a bunker underneath his house and told us if we didn't do the same. Bro, I remember this. Like... The year 1999, and then I was watching the, like, the, the Y2K ball drop thing or whatever. Everyone was scared that, like, all the technology, like, all the computers and shit were gonna change from the 99s to, like, zero zeros, and that would just, like, essentially break all the computers because they didn't know if it was, if all the computers were gonna read 1999. They weren't sure if it was gonna read 1999 to 2000. So, that's the reason why that thing happened. The first blast from the alien mothership would incinerate us. As the seconds counted down, I squeezed my eyes as hard as I could and braced myself for the alien takeover. But, as the clock struck midnight, nothing happened. When I opened my eyes at 12.01am, it wasn't alien motherships I saw, or computers exploding that I heard, but instead an ensemble of banging pots and pans. <laughs> Doomsday, despite worldwide hysteria, turned out to be one of history's greatest flukes. Yep. I was alive. The infamous Y2K scare is one of those moments in time that felt very anticlimactic, despite the terrible thoughts that I was going to be burned to a crisp. At least it was something exciting. As a teenager during the 90s, I had dreams of a futuristic society by the Cyberpunk. turn of the decade. One of flying cars, robots, laser guns, and space jumping into new galaxies like I saw in Star Wars. Oh you my know, god. You know, all the cool shit that you saw in movies like Independence Day and Terminator 2. I had no idea you could do I that. I dreamed. Oh yes I did. I dreamed about flying to Mars and waking up next to Sharon Stone after watching Total Recall. When nothing happened and the world went back to its same old boring self, Sport I felt mode. utterly disappointed. So I did the only thing I could. I popped in a copy of Back to the Future that I had re-recorded over my dad's VHS tape. Oh my god. VCRs. <laughs> I remember that shit, man. I never did have a VCR, like, rewritable, though. I never could figure that out. Like, how to record shit. Like, it had a record button, but it just never worked. Or maybe I didn't even know how to do it. I was too young to figure it out. Tape labeled Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Contest. Grabbed a pack of sour oh warheads my from God. my secret stash and fell asleep shortly after reading the latest episode of EGM. When I woke up the next day, little did I know that I'd be glad oh, no. Y2K didn't kill us all because this decade would be one of, if not the best eras for video games ever. Just about True. everything you could possibly think of that was exciting happened in the 2000s. And the I remember playing Jack and Daxter. I played all of those things on play PlayStation 2 or whatever. Those were fun. That was my jam. It was Jack and Daxter, and was it Ratchet and Clank? This was a 10 year period where video game culture exploded like I never thought it was possible. In the 90s, video games were just getting a foothold into a society where people spent most of their time outside. I was a dork, and I had my dorky friends, and we had our golden eye tournaments high up in my tree fort. We yep. Same. Bro, it was like, for me, it was like. PlayStation, I had a PlayStation and an Xbox. I was like so lucky. So, like, I'd be playing my, uh, what was it? I would actually go to my friend's house down the street and we would have like the Halo LAN parties or whatever, like every week because not only did my friends play, his parents played, like, his whole family played his other brother, his sister, his dad, and the mom, and then their aunts and uncles came over and they played. And it was like a whole, you know, you had the little hub part where you'd like uh, hooked in all the little, what was it, the Ethernet cords or whatever. And there would be like the living room TV, the, the bedroom, the one bedroom, like the parents' bedroom, the kids' bedroom, and like another random bedroom. Pinned up a wooden sign carved, no girls allowed, but beyond this tree forts, our gaming garage setup, and the odd trip to the local arcade, this was my entire gaming world. 
But when 2000 came around, it wouldn't just be us dorks playing video games into the starry night. Games would dig their clutches into the very fabric of the world. And that is no mm -hmm. understatement. Games and tech advanced so suddenly that it's very difficult to comprehend how fast time seemed to fly during this 10 year window. All sorts of crazy new genres began to pop up. Game design fundamentally changed given increased hardware capacity in broader markets. There were so many systems with varying features and hardware and all sorts of weird controllers, online features, oh, yeah. and a lot of gimmicks. Bro, the original Xbox, or whatever, had a gigantic controller. Like, I don't know, I'm trying to look around to see if I, it's like, like I, ah. the, the controller was massive, all right? Because there would be like a gigantic version of it that came with the Xbox. And then you could go to the store and get like the mini version, which was like slightly smaller and you could actually like grip it or whatever. It's like when you're like a little kid, you know, you could barely hang on to this thing. It's like, you didn't know how to grab it. Do I do like too much fingers on the bottom? Then my thumbs can't even like go over it onto the top. And it was just bad. That was the bad controller. Whenever I went to like a friend's house and that was their spare controller, I'd be like, oh shit, I gotta use this thing. I'd be like fucked. This was the decade of innovation. The landslide of gaming popularity began the very first year of the decade when Sony launched the PlayStation 2 in October. In the 90s, if you wanted a Nintendo 64, you could go out and buy it. You might have to visit a few stores, but if you had the cheddar, you were getting the system but not with a PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 was the system that began the trend of having to show up at a store the day beforehand and see if people were waiting outside in oh line my God. already. I know this because I actually had to camp out overnight at Walmart to get one. I sh you not. I stood next to a reeking dumpster outside the building for 18 hours to get the PlayStation 2. This was the first time I ever experienced anything like this. Truth be told, I nearly froze to death overnight like a popsicle. And food? <laughs> I'd rather starve to death before leaving the line. I damn well nope. nearly pissed myself too. Only eight of the 60 people lined up got a system that morning. Eight of the 60 people. Holy crap. If I was the ninth person in line, I would be giga pissed. Like, wow. <laughs> like, thankfully, I never did that, like, line waiting thing. Because I would just wasn't, like, that dedicated or whatever. I didn't give a shit. And also, I don't know. I just, I never did it, <laughs> but I would always like drive by like the GameStop or whatever. And I would look and I would always be like, wow, those guys are so cool. They're standing in line for video games. Meanwhile, it's like, nah, man, that's not it. The rest left embarrassed. That's how far gaming had come in just a few short years. Video games yep. weren't just Nintendo games anymore. The PlayStation was one of the most successful gaming consoles of all time, but you didn't have to risk getting mugged if you zonked out for a second in a shady parking lot just to get it. <laughs> but when 2000 came to a close, gaming would spread through the world like a wildfire. There were several reasons for this. First, gaming oh, wow. had become way more than the beeps and bots of its heydays. Pong was out, high definition 3D graphics were in, with new controllers, better performance, and online play. The most important thing was you didn't need to be a gamer to recognize and appreciate games during the 2000s, whereas no. you wouldn't know what the hell you were looking at if you were in the 80s and you were not a gamer. You what had to have it? an extreme amount of imagination to play an Atari game, for example. Yeah. Getting your grandma to understand what the hell was happening in this screen I don't even know quest what the was like happening. trying to explain what the meaning of life was to an orangutan. In the 2000s though, people, real non-gaming people, could actually look at a TV and see the difference in video game genres now. And with new controllers and lots of new options, it was easier to play them oh too. God. Not everyone can play Ghouls and Ghosts in the 80s, but everyone could play Wii Sports Wii? in 2006. The Wii was the The first hotness. few months of the 2000s were simply nuts. The Dreamcast was the last system launched in the 90s, and it was incredibly underrated. It would eventually be discontinued in March of the following year, but it would deliver some amazing titles up into its demise. Just in the first 30 days of the year... Bro, crazy taxi. I remember going to, like, all, like, the Walmarts and the bowling alleys. I think it was mostly the bowling alleys that had crazy taxi. And I would just dunk quarters into that game because it was so fun. I wasn't good at it, really. And seldom did I ever beat a level. But I had fun doing it. The Dreamcast launched Crazy Taxi, Legacy of Kane, Soul Reaver, and what I consider the greatest Resident Evil game ever made, Code Veronica. Followed by Dead or Alive 2, Rayman 2, Skies of Arcadia, Jet Set Radio, and Grandia 2, just to name a couple. 
not to mention Shenmue, which had just launched three days before Y2K, which was one of the most hyped games ever. You want to talk about a console that was all about the games? The Dreamcast was not f***ing around. Sadly, when the PlayStation 2 hit in October, interest plummeted so hard that Sega was forced to throw in the towel, marking the end of one of the coolest game systems ever made. But not without last one, Hurrah! And that game was Fantasy Star Online. Oh boy. I can't even describe how wild it was to play an online RPG on a console on launch as a kid in 2000. It was like being in a dream. I never Prior played this. Prior to the Dreamcast, you couldn't really play games online unless you bought weird adapters like the Sega Saturn Netlink, which nobody did. It was literally the first system with a built-in modem. I had been playing a few games online for a few hey. years now on my PC like Diablo 1, but nothing like the power of 128 bits. With the Dreamcast, you could plop yourself down on the couch and game online while scarfing down Pringles. I mean, this was avant-garde gaming at its finest. That's it was ghetto and slower than cows, but hey, it was real. I lost myself in games like Choo Choo Rocket, Ooga Booga, and Bomberman Online. <laughs> Can you believe I never this owned is an Dreamcast. actual race of 4x4 EVO played on Sega Net 23 years ago? It's insane. But nothing really compared to Fantasy Star Online. It was the first online console game that really hooked me, and I remember how surreal it was walking around town seeing actual real-life people in a console game, then walking out into the forest and gunning down monsters and watching other people do the same, but with <laughs> laser swords. And you could actually type to people if you had the Dreamcast keyboard. If you had the Dreamcast mouse as well, you can play Quake and Unreal tournaments. Bro, imagine nowadays if they made like a specific like PlayStation keyboard, PlayStation mouse, Xbox keyboard, Xbox mouse. Oh my God, that'd be so funny. Online. Again, it was jank, but this is where it all started. And there's something really special about being part of a revolution, an inception, in the moment, at that time, despite how ghetto it was. The saying that you just had to have been there is real. Of yeah. course, online gaming was very niche and very pricey, because families didn't want you holding the phone line hostage. Especially if the Dreamcast was in another room from the phone line, where you'd have to drag the cable across the house to connect it, essentially creating a 30-foot tripwire of death. God oh, forbid yeah. if anyone hit that thing, they'd crash to the ground and break a hip. Mm -hmm. Eventually, other consoles would catch up to the online scene, namely the Xbox. When the Xbox released in November of 2001, it would officially declare war with the PlayStation 2, which had come out one year the console wars who can forget that before the xbox was pretty damn amazing and unlike today they actually had a lot of great first party titles most importantly it allowed for broadband connectivity and included a hard drive disc for storage two things that crippled online play for the dreamcast not to mention negated the rather annoying prospect of having to insert those fat stupid memory cards into the controller <laughs> those things nearly gave me carpal tunnel Many Xbox games had online functionality when they released into Xbox Live in 2002, including fighting, racing, shooting, and many off-color game modes like Competitive Conquer or Spies vs. Mercs what? for Chaos Theory. Oh my god, Spies vs. Mercs it was so good. Like, me and my buddy Kyle played the shit out of Spies vs. Mercs. It was so good. Spies would, like, essentially always win just because of, like, how the game was designed. You had, like, your little, like, taser rifle or whatever. And you had one teammate to like perma stun one dude. And then you walked up through your smoke down. Uh, your other teammate, you would walk up, throw the smoke down. And then you're as a merc, your screen is just obscured. So you have no idea where the, the spy is. You just have like a bunch of little symbols going off around you. Like somebody's near. And then you have this one ability as a merc to just like do like an AOE like whirlwind thing. And then you you bait that out as the spy, and then once that happens, you run around them, and you like get behind them and choke them out and knock them down or or whatever, and then that's like it takes a life off of like the mercs or whatever. It was so overpowered. This one game truly defined my year like no other. You simply don't get these types of creative online experiences today. There was even a Far Cry game called Instincts that you can play online and a Forza game that was actually really fun. You could even play poker online with randos with World Poker Tour. One game that was also really popular was, of course, Battlefront 2 for the Xbox, where you'd have massive battles rage on into the night. And let me tell you, people were hyped as shit for this one. 
But the most popular game on the Xbox had to be Unreal Championship, the console version of Unreal Tournament. If you never played Quake on PC in the 90s, this was an experience to be had. To a kid who had only been playing couch co-op his whole life on console, it felt like an out-of-body experience, being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some random kid in Queens and know that when you teabagged him after you killed him, he absolutely saw it. Yeah. But honestly, the most fun I ever had playing with other people in the 2000s wasn't online. It was System Link and LAN parties. Yep. The Xbox came with the ability to connect four consoles Link, together with called. four TVs, allowing 16 players to play together at the same time. It was yep. absolutely insane. My friends and I hosted game fests at each other's houses all the time, and we'd order pizza and soda until the cows came home. And Xbox had the best game for System Link. Halo. Yep. We only played one game mode, which was 16 player CTF on Blood Gulch, and our battles went far into the nights until our parents threatened to come downstairs and beat the shit out of us for being so loud. When the smoke cleared, oh we sat there drenched in sweat, hoarse to the bone from screaming, with piles of mm -hmm. cheese breadcrumbs running down the sides of our asses. The marinara had been spilled hours ago and no one seemed to notice. And honestly, we didn't care. It wasn't our house anyway. It was just pure chaotic fun that no one ever today could understand unless you were there. Yeah. And the same goes for LAN parties, where you'd have kids bring over their PCs to each other's houses and hook them up for fat battles of Warcraft 3 and Tribes 2. Dude, do you remember Tribes 2? This was my favorite futuristic jetpack I never played team tribes. shooter and you could land it with up to 128 people or bots. It was incredible. This trend of couch co-op and landing itself though wouldn't last forever. As online features became more mainstream and society became addicted to social media, Facebook, and computers, traditional yep. co-op games became few and far between and lands became yearly tournaments like QuakeCon. In fact, game genres became quite specialized as the new systems migrated towards their own targeted demographics. Microsoft yep. and Sony would be what do you mean targeted demographics? It's it's like claiming that uh, like each console had a different target demographic is so hilarious because it's like who's playing video games? Mostly young boys. Uh, what ages? I don't know. When's the first time you pick up uh, a controller? I don't know. Twelve to I don't know twenty one or whatever. That was the target audience at that time or whatever. 18 to 25, something like that. The great rivals throughout the 2000s, and even to this day, the feud is ongoing. They vie for the same space, more or less, in the gaming markets, offering modern gaming experiences with mature rated video game titles. Xbox yeah. offered more services on its online platform and more features, but content-wise, you can generally find similar styles of games on both systems. It's interesting, though not peculiar, that Nintendo decided very on not to take part in the rat race and focused instead on light-hearted games yeah. like Mario, Metroid, Kirby, and Zelda. Yeah, the, the Nintendo systems were just doing their own thing. Whenever Xbox and PlayStation were just going at it, bickering over like console exclusives and whatnot, Nintendo was just over there on its side of the court, just doing its thing, dominating the handheld uh, industry. You know, everybody had a, some sort of Game Boy. And then everybody had a, a an N64, a GameCube, you know, playing Pokemon Snap, uh, Pokemon Stadium, Super Smash Brothers, you know, all these things. Those games are for everyone. And with interesting controller setups like the Wiimotes, you'd never find violent action games, standard FPS games, or controversial titles like The Last of Us on Nintendo consoles. When most people talk about the popularity of gaming, they often say that Microsoft and Sony have the most players and that Nintendo has always been trailing behind, but that couldn't be more far from the truth in the 2000s. In fact, of the 10 top selling games of the decade, 8 were from Nintendo, and the yeah. top 7 are all from Nintendo. The only game franchise that came close was Grand Theft Auto, and if you look at the top 30 top selling games of the 2000s, Nintendo holds 19. The highest yeah. selling game was Wii Sports. Yeah, because Nintendo didn't... Their target audience was more broad than uh, Xbox and PlayStation. They wanted to appeal to everybody and bring more people into gaming. That's why like Wii Sports was like number one. <laughs> in fact, with 82 million units sold, which was for the time the highest selling video game ever. Eventually it would be overthrown by Minecraft and GTA 5, but during the 2000s, Nintendo was one of the top dogs, releasing four really great platforms, the Game Boy Advance, the GameCube, the Wii, and the Nintendo DS. Oh, I yeah. personally think the GameCube is one of the best systems to ever hit the scene. Mm -hmm. Although the GameCube fell into last place in the race, it's the most critically under system next to the DC. It was a little purple. 
it wasn't really so much a console as it was a Super Smash Melee holder because that's essentially the only game that was ever played in it, at least with like me and my friend group or whatever. I remember, remember distinctly, um, like each of us had like our own GameCubes and then one of our friend's GameCubes, um, the lid wouldn't open, but the game that was stuck in there was Super Smash. So we just call it the Smash system. <laughs> Because, and we would use his console all the time. A box of creativity with a cute handle, but at its heart, it was a pulsating volcano of awesomeness. Unlike the Wii, which was for everyone, including your grandma, the GameCube was actually still a console for hardcore gamers. With it came an interesting controller that was perfect for the new creative 3D titles it would house. Predating the somewhat gimmicky era of motion controls and the shackles of capitalistic game regurgitation, the GameCube was a treasure box full of many games that have become long-standing staples in gaming culture. Just flipping through a little bit of the gold brings me back to a time where gaming was truly at its peak with some of the best Nintendo first-party titles ever made. You pretty oh, yeah. much got everything with the Cube. All the great first-party titles, M-rated smashers like Killer7 and Eternal Darkness, mm -hmm. the best Paper Mario game, Kart Racers, really good Star Wars games, and one of the best soccer games ever made. Oh, yeah. GameCube titles truly made... Un like, the Nintendo sports games were the only sports games that I ever played because all of, like, the realistic ones, like the NFLs, NHLs, the soccer ones or whatever, they would just be, like, normal-looking but the Nintendo Sports ones, they would always have like a couple niche, like random fun things in there. And I don't know, when I was younger, that just appealed to me more. Unimaginable things happen while nailing the design and the gameplay of their titles. And I always thought the mini discs they came on were really cute, even the though the tech discs. of the key was actually one of the reasons it's viewed at as a commercial failure, despite being one of the best systems ever for gamers. The PS2 and the Xbox had DVD players, which at the time was very cost effective, practical and offered more capacity for the third party scene, while the GameCube had a handle. It made the system look like a breadbasket. Yeah. More importantly, it also had no support for online play and the perception of being less powerful, which wasn't entirely... Yeah, but you didn't really need online play because back in the day, like you said earlier, everyone had friends, everyone went outside or whatever. Everyone was still in school, so they had like some sort of like way to communicate with people, um, you know, at least physically in person. So it was as easy as, you know, going to school and be like, hey, you want to come over after and... uh. And play Super Smash? Yeah, sure. You didn't really need online with the Nintendo GameCube. Entirely true. In the 2000s, graphics were a really big part of gaming discourse, and it was often just as important to have really good looking titles as it was to have really good playing titles to attract buyers who were on the fence. Yeah. And GameCube titles looked, on average, worse than the really pretty shiny graphics of yep. Xbox and such. And that's a shame because I think the Nintendo GameCube was an absolute rock star of a system. Either way, Nintendo would make much more headway with the Wii in 2006, selling five times as many consoles as the GameCube. Another enormous trend from the 2000s was the evolution of PC gaming. By the end of the 90s, several... Back in the day, I did not do any PC gaming at all. It wasn't even until, like, a couple years ago that I got into PC gaming. I was always a console boy. Blockbuster online games had come into the scene like StarCraft, Diablo, Warcraft 3, and several big-time RPGs and all the competitive shooters like Unreal Tournament. When Diablo 2 came out in 2000, though, it was clear that PC gaming was not just here to stay, but a force to be reckoned with. I can't even describe how much of my life I put into this one single game, just trying to find a win force, which has eluded me to this day. I wish I could have some of those hours of my life back, I was so addicted. But it wasn't just Diablo that burst into the scene. As I said before, a cornucopia of games flooded the decade, and it wasn't long before there were so many games available that you couldn't possibly play them all. In just a few short years, PC fans got Counter-Strike, Deus Ex, Knights of the Old Republic, Half-Life, Half-Life 2, Oblivion, Morrowind, Max Payne, and so many more games that are still held in high regard today. The variety oh, yeah. was truly incredible, starting a new trend in getting games into the hands of so many Is this what different Morrowind people. Like? It wasn't just the nerds playing games anymore like the 90s. The most important game of the 2000s though was arguably The Sims. Having gotten my first PC soon after, I can say The Sims was one of the coolest and most messed up and fucked up games I've ever played. <laughs> this is a game where you take control of a bunch of people as they go about their day. You start by making a house, then you have to feed your family, shower them, make friends, go to work, maintain your relationships, water your plants, 
invest in stocks, <laughs> invite friends over, and all this other weird stuff. You can see the requirements in the bottom right of the screen. I remember for The Sims back in the day with when back in the day when they were like blockbusters. Uh Playboy came out with their own version of like Playboy Sims or whatever. And that was the only time I played a Sims game was the Playboy version. Screen. These are all the things you have to micromanage. That includes hygiene. So yes, you have to watch your character take a dump in the toilet. As a kid, this was kind of nasty. The same went for how your house could start looking like a landfill if you didn't take care of it. If you didn't take out your trash or wash your dishes, your house would start smelling like a garbage dump. And if you didn't bang your wife, she wouldn't love you anymore. <laughs> yes, you can watch your character have sex as the little pixels go humpy humpy. And if you didn't take care of your kids, child protective services would show up and take them away. Oh Again, as a God. kid, this was so surreal to me. You can even set your house on fire and kill everyone. It's truly one of the weirdest games I've ever seen, and I can't even believe it got made. But it got so many people into gaming during a period where, just a few years beforehand, they looked down on such a media. Mm. Because it was chill and required basically no skill. With just a little bit of attention, anyone can play The Sims and have a good time with it. It was approachable, understandable, and easy to use. Mm -hmm. AKA accessible, one of the trends that would alter the fortunes of gaming to this very day. These kinds of games were everywhere in the 2000s, like Roller Coaster Tycoon, but there was also tons of stuff for other types of players too. All sorts of complex simulation games like EVE Online, online shoot-em-ups, puzzlers, role-playing games, MMOs, and creative genre breakers like Guitar Hero and Dance Dance Revolution. Talk about bridging the gap between gamers and watchers. And then there were really niche titles like Black and White, which was my first god game. I'm not even sure what this game was all about. I remember Black and White. My buddy... Uh, Julian got black and white and he's like essentially you're just God and you can just make civilizations and that's it I was like oh that sounds pretty cool and Sacrifice was the other game that just blew my mind. Again, another new age fusion game blending combat, action, and RTS. This particular game was so fascinating to me because as a kid I couldn't even have dreamed up a concept like this. Just to nail this point home, this was the decade that Beautiful Joe and Pikmin launched on GameCube and Okami for the PlayStation 2. There were so many weird and wonderful types of games. The 90s seemed so simple compared to all this. Like I said, it was the era of innovation. One such creative title introduced in 2000 called No One Lives Forever shows a very different side to the FPS than you'd ever find today. This era was all about taking chances, but this wouldn't last forever. Far into the next decade, more aggressive business practices encouraged copycat game development, for-profit oh incentives like overly monetizing titles and stuffing all sorts of in-game stores yep. and pre-order bonuses into the mix. As the this was a good way to get more money for every dollar spent, but its ethics are questionable. The horse armor. The, the one thing that started it all. All of this bullshit online, pay to win, pay for cosmetics, pay for this, pay for that. It all started with the, what was it, Oblivion? The Oblivion horse armor. This was the first, this was the first big one. Uh, I think there was a couple, a game or two that did it before, but the horse armor was the thing that set it off. Regardless, it's landed us where we are today, where every game seems like it's trying to shoot for the financial stars. But in the yeah. 2000s, every single genre had its day, from kart racers to 4X strategy games to Sudoku sex anime games and everything else you could think of. What? Though the popularity of some of those would wane as the decade went on, like beat-em-ups, point-and-clicks, and of course, the once-beloved platformer that we all know and love. And honestly, arcades too, unfortunately, would be left in the dust given the popularity and availability of consoles, online gaming, and PC gaming. By 2009, you could play a game with anyone, from anywhere, from the comfort of your own couch, have a friends list, and chat online or even voice chat, all while playing games that in no way, shape, or form are representative of today's most popular. You have to understand that during the 2000s, gaming culture wasn't anything like it is today. There Still weren't in any beta. MOBAs, <laughs> Escape or from Battle Tarkov? Royale games, <laughs> or Minecraft, or Overwatches. Those games came in the following decade. You didn't stream. Twitch wasn't founded yet. Yep. You didn't have smartphones TTVs. for games until the very end of the decade. YouTube was just starting up, and this idea of online communities among games wasn't really a thing yet. Yep. Reddit was also very new and underutilized. It was game sites like game trailers that were popular, not raid. 
Oh my god, I actually remember game trailers. Like the website, I like favorited it, and then it would be like YouTube or whatever, and it's like whatever new game trailer or article or review came out, it would just like populate and just something new would come out every couple hours, just boom, 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 and it'd be like, oh, what's new today? Raging internet news tycoon YouTubers. People discussing the games industry in provocative and lucrative ways wasn't really a thing. There was no lavish monetization in gaming, no battle passes, no season passes, no loot boxes or anything like that. Yep. You might have a couple things you could buy, but all of that was yet to come. In the early days, it was more or less no drama, all fun. Several big games- Yeah, it's quite the opposite now. It's all drama and no fun now. <laughs> Games had giant communities though. Iconic titles like RuneScape and World of Warcraft, EverQuest 2 would pretty much take over the lives of innocent kids across the world including myself. Counter-Strike was insanely popular, but MMOs were the most powerful games by far on PC. This iconic picture showcases the insanity of oh. 10 million active subscribers per month at the turn of the decade. That's $150 million in revenue each month, ongoing for a decade. Can you imagine that kind of cheddar? Nope. World of Warcraft not only paved the groundworks for the modern MMO, but it changed the face of cooperative and online play forever. Not just PvP gameplay like Counter-Strike. WoW is a social game. You can talk to people to get groups, you could trade, run dungeons, do PvP, or craft and exploit the in-game economy with the auction house. All while interacting with other players in any way you wanted. Whereas games could be beaten in a single sitting in the 90s, you could essentially play WoW forever. Yeah. It became the norm in the 2000s to save games and come back later to them, especially given how consoles had either internal hard drives or memory cards now. This had a large effect on the evolution of video game difficulty. But having a character in a living, breathing, ongoing world was simply on another level though. There was no end screen and you'd never see the words game over. You were nope. the character and the world was yours, but it would come at a cost. World of Warcraft came with an upfront cost, plus $15 a month for your yeah. subscription. Back in the day, this was a big ask. Um, because it's, it, it hasn't really changed <laughs> since then. And back, back in the day when I used to play World of Warcraft, um, when did I start? I think I started at the end of TBC and I kept on playing until, what was it? The end or maybe the beginning of Cataclysm. That's when I initially played and I remember, you know, being on Ventrilo, being on the Ventrilo server, you know, in there with the boys, with the guild, just bullshitting. Everybody's like, I don't know, 14, 15, 16. It's been so long, man. I remember. I played WoW for 10 years, which means I forked over almost $2,000 for this game. It damn near bankrupted me, and in my addiction I ended up homeless living in a casino hotel, gambling my nights away to afford my room. This was definitely a turning point for gaming, caused primarily by the new age of subscriptions. The only other things the game had leading up to subscriptions were expansion packs, but even then you only had to buy it once. Subscriptions never ended, which led to DLC, which led to in-game stores, which paved the way for microtransactions, which led to seasons, which ignited yep. the pre-order bonus online culture where you can pay 20 more dollars to play a game a week before everyone else, which has led to us changing the way game progression systems are now designed, oh, which yeah. brings you up to today, where you're never really sure if you're getting everything you should be when you fork over the money. Nope. Step back and look at modern gaming from a peanut gallery and you'll see the monetization buffet feasting on an industry driven by big business, that's for sure. But when you bought a game in the 2000s, you pretty much got the whole game. Oh yeah. Back in the day, when you bought a game, you get the whole game, and it's in its final version. Maybe you would find, like, a bug or two, but for the most part, I didn't really come across a lot of bugs whenever I played on my, like, early day consoles or whatever. Now, it's like, if a game comes out, and it's got, you know... Like maybe a handful of bugs that's a good game you know but you know but yeah wow had a subscription but there was never a moment where you questioned the ethics of its content wow was generous and large it wasn't selling boosters or max level characters or cosmetics in the store and content wasn't ripped out of the base game to use as dlc at least it didn't seem like that and that goes for basically every other game i played 
I never got the suspicion that games were being chopped up behind the scenes. Finding a game, especially on the console, ransacked with in-game monetization was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Yeah. Games may have been shitty, but if you bought a game, you were getting the full package. Yep. A lot of people tend to look back and say that older games were better, but if you actually lived through the 2000s, you'd find tons of crappy games, just like- No, that's just nostalgia. Like today. They were more feature complete, but I could show you 100 bad games from this decade. But you only need to look at something like Simpsons Wrestling or Batman Dark Tomorrow. Anyone could tell just from this footage that these games are Diarrhea City. But it wasn't just these games, there were tons of issues across all genres. Terrible movie adaptations, horrible ports given the variants of new PC hardware, and lots of control issues. What is happening? When you have an era of innovation, there are always going to be a bunch of turds floating around. And you have to remember that refunding games wasn't as available as it is today. There weren't Steam refunds, and if you opened a box at your store, you probably wouldn't get back what you paid for it. <laughs> Hell, one time, Walmart made me open oh, a copy Superman. of Superman 64 I brought back to return and plug it into their display unit and show them my save file just so they could see if I had played the game. I felt so embarrassed because I did play the game. I just wanted to return it because it was shit. There was a lot of risk playing games, no doubt. Well, what you do is you do that once, and then you learn from that. And then after that, uh, what you do is whenever you buy a game, or at least back in the day, a physical copy, or at least like on the discs, like with the discs in the boxes, is like you, you buy like a brand new game and it's got this wrapper on it, all right? And you take like a razor blade and you perfectly cut the, the on the seam of the box, like on the top and on the side and on the bottom, but you don't cut the sticker. Um, that's, you know, cause there's a sticker that's like keeping the box closed and sometimes there would be like one on the top, one on the bottom and one on the side. So you'd have to be careful not to cut those. So that way you could take the plastic wrap off perfectly and then you set it down. And then once you do that, you carefully peel the stickers off, off of each edge or whatever. And you have to do it so there's like you know, very, like, a small amount of, like, your fingerprint on it. I never used gloves. I probably could have. Um, so you peel the stickers off, and then you just, like, stick them on, like, I don't know, like, the side of a table or whatever. And then you just, you open the box, got the stickers out, you take the disc out, you take the disc out, you set it there, and then you remember those stacks of CDs or whatever? You just get a CD, like a blank one, whatever, put it back in there. And then you close the box and you put the stickers perfectly back on and seal them up. And then, because you still got that plastic wrap thing, you, you put the plastic on perfectly because you have a little seam, you know, you take, what was that box tape? It was like, it wasn't like the normal scotch tape because that tape was like, it was kind of what, it wasn't like perfectly translucent. It was like the box tape or whatever that, you know, you like stretch it out and you like put on a box, but it was perfectly clear. You slice a small sliver of that, um, just wide enough to cover the seal on it and you cover it and voila, you have a game right there and then you have an unopened game box with a CD in it and then you just return it to Walmart and be like hey uh, my mistake uh, I accidentally got this for my cousin he already has this game can I just get my money back uh yeah sure all right there you go and that's how you do it Outs, and a lot of rental stores had limited copies of games. My local video store never had copies of new games. Some lowlife would always get there before me. So I had to rely on rare game demo CDs that would sometimes come with new editions of EGM. Though honestly, game magazines and rentals wouldn't be that big of a part of game culture as the decade closed out. Netflix and Redbox would put so much pressure on the brick and mortar that they'd be driven out of business just a few years after the 2000s oh, yeah. ended. As the sun of the 2000s began to set, games were in a completely different spot than when it started. Oh yeah. 
huge the difference. The 7th generation consoles were getting mature and all the big companies were getting ready to release their next systems in the coming years. Systems like the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 now had wireless controls, online functionality, and new tech like Blu-ray players or motion controls or tilt features. Ventrilo was founded and Steam was making headway, so you can now buy games online and voice chat with all of your friends. Advances in presentation were making games incredibly atmospheric, even movie-like. Iconic titles like Killzone 2 and Uncharted 2 featured beautiful on-rails technology that were some of the first real-time set pieces that I ever experienced. It was now possible to retain control while games came alive in the background, territory once reserved for pre-rendered cutscenes, and a huge leap forward for missions like Stalingrad from Call of Duty 1 just a few years beforehand. Oh, I remember that. Smartphones were gaining momentum. The mobile gaming EVC. crave was about to take the world by storm. And gaming had changed. RPGs were getting huge. Worlds were becoming open, and sequels were becoming a big thing too. All around the world, people were playing games, at home, online, and in trains going to and from work. In the following decade, games would become so mainstream that you'd no longer be an outcast, leading to even more popularity as streaming platforms would burst onto the scene and once yep. again change the face of gaming forever. There's no denying that the 2000s were, with the 90s, the two most defining decades in all of gaming. No other period of 20 years would see so much change and transform our culture, its people, how accepted we were, and how we played, shared, and experienced games. It was a time where video games thrived in so many creative ways and where people took a chance on an idea, even though they didn't know if it would work out. Creating a breathtaking handful of years where games were made through passion creation rather than profit creation. Before games became the commodities that they are today, and gaming culture became what it is now. Every era has its ups and downs, and modern gaming has given us some incredible titles, but it's also changed so much of the heart of game development that it feels very yep. estranged from this period. The 90s and the 2000s were simple times where gaming was pure bliss. I carried gaming with me through high school and into college, through my entire life, and through all the changes of video game genres and gimmicks and fads. There were so many beloved titles, and I had so many wonderful memories during this time, playing by myself, with my old friends, and with all the new people I met in the online scene. There were so many memories that it was impossible oh, to show them all in this the one video, and that's a sign that the 2000s was where gaming might have been at its best. Thanks for watching. If you have a story to share about your experience in the 2000s, please feel free to post it in the comment section below. I'll see you guys in our next video. Peace. Dang. That was a good video. That was a good throwback. Seeing all those games. Oh my god. I want to see more, man. That was a great video. Definitely. Um. Yeah. This era hits all the nostalgia buttons for me. It's the decade I started gaming, and many of my favorite games franchises have their roots here. Really great video. Yeah, man, 100%, man. Like, I played so many games, like, back in the day, probably to my detriment, and why I was only, like, an average student in school. Well, you know, some kids were like, oh, I'm an A student. I'm an AB student. I was like, I'm only, like, a CB type student. I'm, like, average. I'm like, dang. But, you know, it is what it is, man. But definitely, man, I like this video. Uh, you said you had, like, a 90s one. I want to see, like, uh, the 90s one, and maybe you'll do, like, a 2010s one. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. But, all right, that's pretty much it. Later.